Of course. No. I will. Thank you. But most of us do. So who? Who can be honest and understandable? The onus is on you. Okay. I'll do my best. Thank you. So I am Vivi, and it's a pleasure to be here tonight. I brought some pictures along, no text, so I, I'll try to use this. But first off, oh, what are you doing? It's my phone, it's easy. Okay, so first off, I might actually, might, I would actually like to ask you a question, which is, it is, I believe, oh, Five Celsius outside, and you are here tonight rather than being in the comfort of your homes, right? <laughs> so, at least if you are from Lisbon, as I am, you would seriously wonder what is it about the current state of the world that impels you to leave your couches, your beds, your I don't know what else, your fluffy, furry, warm animals in your homes to be here <laughs> So, why are you here? Why are you here? The collapse of the sewers in our street. Sorry? Uh, the sewer has collapsed in my The sewer has collapsed. <laughs> so that's, that's one reason to be here. Is it <laughs> Another reason to be here tonight. Climate change. Sorry? Climate change. Okay. Uh, climate change, sewers. Inspiration. Inspiration. To learn more and to get more involved in change. So I think we've got quite a diverse set of motivations to be here, just as your answer just showed. And I would make, might make a slight bet that we have some kind of shared sense, be it about sewers, be it about climate change, be it about inspiration in some way, or learning how to get more involved, that somehow perhaps and our mechanism of representation, in particular our mechanisms of political representation, could do with some updating could benefit from some sort of improvement that would make us believe our voices come from more. So let me, based on this shared sense, uh, let me rewind a bit and tell you how uh, is a church I shouldn't swear and yes, there are these two people in this room that can vouch for me swearing in class, but I will not swear in church because I just developed a religious girlfriend. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> me so, uh, let me rewind and tell you why we are here. Well, I am here tonight because I spent, I lived for a period, long period of time in the US and in 2010 I moved back to Europe. In particular, I actually moved to the UK, which is not my native country, as you can tell. Uh, and that, however, led me to go to my home country a lot more often. It led me to go to Portugal regularly. And if you, as I'm sure you do, follow in some capacity the news in 2010, what was happening was a, a major, major uh, implementation of this so-called austerity measures that we've already heard about. And Portugal is not just beaches, it was also uh, saw a huge spike in poverty rates and very palpable <coughs> forms of misery that resulted from these widely impopular measures that were nonetheless taken, in, that were taken in spite of massive protests that were not unique to Portugal, as I'm sure you know. Um, however, in spite of all the protest, protests and discontent that was so palpable, perhaps what was most frustrating to some of us was this sense of powerlessness. This sense that you can protest all you want, you can write what you want, you can say what you want, but nonetheless, what good is it going to be? Um, and Portuguese's desperate inclination towards uh, hopelessness is what, why we documented it. Gave, gave rise to Sabo, I don't know if any of you have with the performance kind of Portuguese traditional music style, genre, uh, marked by heavy, massive doses of melancholy. So if you are into that kind of thing, you call that go listen to fun. Uh, this guy was actually more the loss of uh, the Portuguese national team in the 2014 championship. <laughs> but, so what did I do about this? I did the same mistake so many others did, right? I wrote a book because Everybody knows that writing a book is the way to change the world. <laughs> no, uh, we can all vouch for that. So, um, with this though, you can be relatively confident that I will not start to summarize my book for you now. And you can even get it here, so you are totally safe. Once I memorize it, which is, there is a risk. But no, it's fine, you're off the book. So, um, instead of trying to summarize what I wrote for you, which wouldn't be that interesting, 
I was inspired by to share two ideas uh, from that I came up with while structuring the book, and which I think would be particularly relevant to folks like such as yourselves who are into non-party forms of political representation on one hand, or interested in issues of uh, getting this sad notion of public interest being manifested in sewers, climate change, such for situation. <coughs> you are the object. You, you don't need to trouble with that answer. <laughs> or become more involved, for ordinary citizens to become more involved in politics. So the first of these ideas um, has not had me put my engineer cap on, my fake engineer cap on the innovation world, and had me wonder what is it about traditional politics that leads professional politicians to so often stray away <laughs> from actually serving the public interest. And obviously every single one of us will give this notion of public interest a different definition, but that's not problematic for the purpose of this conversation. So uh, let me take this one for, give me that one for granted for the time being. And I came up with three different kinds of answers. The first is that places such as the House of Commons or political institutions in general do tend to attract and select the wrong kind of people. Obviously, this doesn't apply to all excellent independent councils in the room tonight, nor to any of you guys who decide to do similar, uh, join a similar venture. Uh, but there is something about politics, be it the wealth, the status, the influence, this sense of exerting power that seems to be quite attractive to some folks who perhaps are not ideally suited for each other. The second set of factors has got to do with what I call the formatting process, through which young Tony Blair turn, turns into old Tony Blair. And there is something about it, and perhaps I would be, I'd love to hear your experiences on this front, because I just remember, I have no hands on experiences like you guys, on the extent to which you feel this formatting process might also apply to independence or not, in the sense that I, from my own contemplation of the, of the world and within the news, I get the sense that professional politicians often go through, and no matter how public interested they might be when they start, they, and I'm not trying to invest the case of that guy, I don't know, but as in, no matter how public interested that they might be at the start, they somehow undergo a process for which they learn how to obey the party hierarchy, you are often on that one. Uh, they learn how to not to rock the boat too much, they learn how to not to bother established interests too much, they learn basically how to stop representing you. And this is, I believe, is also a relevant factor to keep in mind when we explore alternatives. And the third well, set of factors has got to do with something that was already present in several of the other interventions, which is this notion that we as voters, we do a particularly bad job uh, in, because we are based on a very miserable set of information and we've got, we think very little about the topics and that's not because we are stupid, stupid or apathic as it was mentioned earlier, instead it's purely because of how little uh, our voice is actually matter through all these processes. If you are, well, I, 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 cannot, I was choosing this picture this afternoon and I cannot tell if you frequent man's bathrooms, this is just looks like you. <laughs> Uh, so, moving on to the second point I'd like to make. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, moving on to the second point I'd like to briefly make. There is a political scientist here in Cambridge that I've never actually met. He wrote an excellent book called Confidence Trap. And in this book, his name is David Brunsiman, and his, he, in his book he makes the following part. There's this argument, which I'm picking apart, but I like. And his argument is that. This conversation about democracy being in crisis has been happening for ages, basically. And that it periodically comes up, and his image, his twist, the way I, my mental representation of his argument is that it's a bit like <coughs> politics or democracy as a safety valve. Public politicians do their stuff in this regarding the public interest until public discontent and anger reach dangerous levels. And then suddenly they, not suddenly, but they, they start to, to release some steam. They start to take some measures that they should have taken ages ago as a way to bring it back to safety, to pressure to safety levels. And obviously, and David Wilson presents this as an evidence of the adaptability of democracy, which it is what this argument picture leaves untold is the massive human suffering that can happen in the process and the terrible consequences of many possibly reversible decisions 
but were taken until the Mac and the system self-corrects, sort of. So why am I mentioning this? It's because I think it is it's in, because I think it's useful for us to think of uh, this misalignment between the public interest and the behavior of politicians as being something that happens in the short term, then eventually there will be some kind of convergence, it seems, and then only later on for them to start again periodically going further and further apart. Uh, and I think this is kind of a useful model, mental model for us to keep, to keep in the back of our minds. We will talk about this. This guy basically had many generations before other ones with similar signs. So, to wrap up, uh, where we started, which is again the, the boy, the heck is my here, uh, is nowadays what I've been doing is uh, rather than try to write a second, even shorter book, which was too much trouble, I'm instead, I'm instead involved with a bunch of positive folks, so most, three of them highly respectable types. That's what we do, what we are doing is we have launched an institution in Portuguese civil society called the Citizens Forum. Which aims to do what? It aims to periodically hold a citizens' assembly on how to reform our own political institutions. So what we will be doing is we will be every two years convening an ordinary, uh, convening a sample of ordinary Portuguese citizens that will come together to learn from politicians, uh, experts in academia and elsewhere, important figures from Portuguese civil society. They will, over multiple weekends, learn about how the political institutions in Portugal are working. They will gather suggestions for reforms from the general public. They will deliberate among themselves for a total of 24 days over the course of the semester on how, which of these suggestions are most important, are more relevant, and the best chances of working. And they will eventually present in a, in a public event with it attended hopefully by high level Portuguese political officials and the media, um, a set of recommendations on how to go about to, how to go about bringing better or higher quality political representation in our country. Is this new? Obviously not. This has been done by some fantastic folks uh, the first time around in British Columbia in 2004, later on in Ontario, then in the Netherlands, most recently there was something like this in the Irish. Constitutional Convention, there was a big component of ordinary citizens involved uh, in that process too. What we are claiming, what we are, we are trying to do differently is we are we are domiciling our, our project in a leading Portuguese social science school and by giving it a permanent home, what we have to do is to be able to iter we believe in iteration, uh, in summary. We believe that by doing it over and over again. We will avoid the risk that so often happens to public consultation project, <coughs> projects such as David mentioned in the video, which is that the recommendations might be great, but they will be shelved as soon as the media cycle moves on. We don't want that to happen. We want to have a permanent institution, which we already do, and convenient university, okay, which is a good place to say that academia, academic institutions have got many faults. Uh, being short lived is not one of them, right? So uh, we are hoping that as long as these guys are around, we will at least have a address, a mailing address, you know what they do. So by having a home there in this academic institution, we will be able to over time iterate this process of holding a citizen's assembly and thus give Portuguese civil society an assurance at the very minimum, which is that every two or three years there will be a, diff a new occasion to debate these fundamental issues that Peter brought up, which is how to reform the system, because these fundamental structural issues get all too easily forgotten by the everyday media debate and political topics and politics when we consider it in the conventional sense of the term. So I will take more of your time and, and we, what else? We hope, well, I hope the other guys hope too, but we hope to have more, even more uplifting news next time I can buddy in this beautiful place. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you.